Uh, welcome everyone, buenas tardes. Um, I, feel, I feel very privileged to follow uh, the paper of Andrew's. I thought Andrew's paper was absolutely wonderful. Um, very coherent, very lucid, and I don't think I'm going to come anywhere close to the same lucidity, but I'll try. Um, but I also feel very privileged to be in a panel with, uh, well, I feel privileged to be here, but I feel privileged to be in a panel with David and with Jack, both of whom I've worked with on many projects over the last few years. Um, not least a conference I organised at the University of Kent uh, with Angela Voss, a conference entitled Daimonic Imagination, uh, all to do with uh, human interaction with, with non-human, perhaps non-physical conscious entities. And there was a little email exchange that I had with David, which I'm sure he won't remember, <laughs> which tickled me far more than he probably imagined at the time. And what David had said was that while we were having our conference, which he was looking forward to, the elves were going to have their conference in Elfland, and the subject of their conference was elven encounters with humans. <laughs> now, the reason I particularly like that is because it brings back this question, this word, that appeared time and time again in the conference that I organised, which was a two-day conference, endless papers about spirit beings, um, and it then was a feature of all the papers that were submitted that we published as a book called Daimonic Imagination, and then has been a feature of today's talks, um, and it's featured a lot, and that word is ontology. And it just occurred to me while Jack was giving his talk that if we were all to say the word ontology together about like 13 times, let's try it. One, two, three. Ontology, 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 ontology. See? The word ceases to mean anything at all. Uh, and that's kind of going to be the focus of my talk, really. Um, now, there have been various heuristic strategies, various uh, methods to try and determine the ontological status of other world beings, of other conscious beings, and we've heard some of them already today. And I'll just summarise a couple in order to get something to a foothold from which we can then develop the next, uh, the next perspective. Um, David, in his, the paper that he submitted for us at the conference, which we published, which he entitled brilliantly, So Long As You've Got Your Elf, um, you can see there's a, there's a pattern running through David's titles there. Um, he cites Peter Mayer, a 1992 article, uh, Peter Mayer's article about um, communication with discarnate entities through DMT. And uh, David cites Mayer's three uh, p possible characteristics of the of the elven beings. The first is that they're hallucination. Nothing more than a, than a hallucination. I don't need to go into any detail about that. The second is that they are psychological stroke transpersonal. Now, this is the idea, obviously, as we heard already today from David's talk, um, and obviously a fundamental part of, uh, of Andrew's talk, that these are uh, matters generated by the psyche that we're somehow engaging with, somehow perceiving. <coughs> But nevertheless, they pertain to the individual. They are generated by the individual. I'm going to problematize that in a minute. And the third position um, is that they are other worlds. And this, again, we've heard already today, that these, these creatures belong to a different world, belong to a different reality, and are autonomous in their own existence. Um, there was a trialogue, one of the many trialogues, um, between um, Ralph Abraham and Terence McKenna and Rupert Sheldrake. Um, one of them entitled entities, and Terence began the conversation. He just, and very lucidly, he, rather like I did in the conference that I organized, he, he explains that communication, interaction, engagement <coughs> with non-human conscious entities is a fundamental feature of cultures across time and across the globe. It's, it's absolutely intrinsic to human experience, or so it seems. And then he develops three possibilities, in some respects quite similar to Peter Mayer's, but different. The first he says that these beings are soon to be discovered, that they, at some stage, could be accommodated within our taxonomical schema, that they're just round the corner. And he, and he says they're somewhere between the coelacanth and the Bigfoot. Hold on to that for a little bit. The second position, he argues, uh, he suggests, and again, he dismisses the first. I'll come back to that. The second he dismisses, which he calls the Jungian position, and he actually cites Jung, and he cites Jung from memory, and I was, spent a while trying to dig out which source it it really was, and I think it came from psychological types of 1921. 
but nevertheless, because I'm a nerd, I like these sort of things. Um, but nevertheless, he says, from the Jungian position, what we're looking at is the eruption of unconscious complexes into the conscious mind. Again, we've heard this already, to a certain degree, from Andrew. Um, and <coughs> that hopefully you're, you, you can grasp that idea, that again, rather like with Peter Mayer's second position, that they are somehow generated by the, 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 the individual psyche. And then the third, which was his preferred option, was that they are non-physical and autonomous in their own existence in some way. And that's a lovely thing, and that's something that I've spoken about with David before, um, the idea of stumbling into an elven engagement, um, uh, rather than sort of the idea that you're somehow creating it. And this is something that I found in my reading over the last few years um, of Emanuel Swedenborg, a uh, strange mystic from Sweden who lived in London. And uh, I've now written a few books about him, and I've become very interested in him. And he describes this in relation to the angels. Swedenborg enters the angelic realm, and he finds angels have got stuff to do before he got there. They're still doing their stuff while he's there. Some of them talk with him. And then when he leaves, he can quite clearly tell that they're going to get on with their stuff. I.e., it's, it's, you know, there's no sense at all in Swedenborg's mind that he's somehow generating these angelic beings. But what I really sense, and I sense this is at the heart of what David was arguing in his various pieces, what Peter Mayer was arguing, and certainly what Terence McKenna was arguing, and I get the sense this is what we're kind of all arguing today, as I said earlier, it's all of these. And I can try and explain why. Let's take... Peter Mayer's first and second, the hallucination and the psychological, they're different. But of course you'd have to be extremely dismissive of dreams and visions to assume that a dream or a vision could not have some relationship with the individual story. That it's just random stuff. I would doubt that many of us here would assume that a dream is just random shit. You know, it has a relationship with our own life story. And let's, in relation to Terence's first position, um, that they're soon to be discovered, well, I find that problematic. I mean, I believe you'd have to be fairly naive to assume that you could trap a pixie. I've got one. Yeah? I've got it. I've got a pixie. I've got him. You can see his little leather boots and his little jerkin and his little green breeches. You know, I laid a snare by a fly agaric mushroom and I caught it. Yeah? There it is. We're going to send it off to the lab for tissue sampling. Yeah? It's, it's not going to happen. At least I don't think it's going to happen. Maybe it will. But nevertheless, let's look at the, the words that Terence McKenna used. He says somewhere between the coelacanth and the Bigfoot. Well, the coelacanth is real, but the coelacanth is a mythic, mythic beast. For those who don't know, the coelacanth is this crazy sort of fish-like armoured pre-dinosaur weird fish from the deep ocean of the Indian seas. Um, it's from the Cretaceous period. It's 400 million years old. It's kind of not really real. It's a living fossil. Um, and similarly, if you think about when the Europeans first uh, came across the platypus, they thought it was a joke. They thought that the Aborigines had been playing a joke on them, had been stitching together the parts of different beasts and leaving it for the Europeans to stumble across, which may have been true, actually. But the point I'm driving there is that the relationship between imaginary beings and real beings is totally intertwined, and it's very difficult to distinguish. We look, at, for example, as, a, as a, the lion, for example, as being both symbol and real. And when it's real, it's also symbol, and when it's symbol, it's also real. I'll come back to that. But it's the second position that Terence outlines of dismissing the Jungian, which I find curious, but then it occurred to me that, Jung would, uh, that Terence McKenna would not have been able to have read the Red Book, which was only published in 2009. Now, Terence McKenna was a very, uh, quite wide, wide read in Jung. In fact, he gave this talk in 1991 uh, at the Jung Society in Claremont, California, where he demonstrates a very deep and sympathetic understanding of Jung. But nevertheless, he still had this idea, because he wouldn't have read the Red Book, um, that the psyche still pertains essentially to the individual. It still is a, a field surrounding the nucleus of the ego. And therefore, at the there are matters beyond the psyche, and therefore, therefore to in indicate that, the, that, a, that, a, that a creature could be generated by the psyche implies that it could not have total autonomy in its own will. I hope you're following my rather bumpy logic there. Um, and the reason I say about the Red Book is because the Red Book is a weird and wonderful account of Jung's experiences with biblical characters and creatures of the imagination. It's an illuminated manuscript. It's like some old Victorian Bible. 
Um, and he locked it away in a, in a Swiss bank account. He didn't want anyone to read it until there was a long process by which the Jung family released it for publication. It's an interesting book. But there's this little conversation he has with two biblical characters, um, Elijah and Salome. And Jung is so alarmed at their sheer autonomy that he says, I can hardly reckon you as part of my soul, he says. You are symbol. And Elijah retorts, we are real and not symbols. And then later he returns to this matter and he says, you may call us symbols for the same reason that you can also call your fellow men symbols. You invalidate nothing and solve nothing by calling us symbols. Well, you see, what I understand by this is that at this moment, which was early in Jung's career, it was sort of around the time of the psychic breakdown, um, he understood that non-physical beings encountered through active imagination are nevertheless immensely real and are responsible to their own will. But he also understood, and this I think is fundamental, he understood that we are all daimonic beings. We are all creatures of the imagination. This is something that Mike said earlier, is Mike still here? Um, we are all creatures of the imagination, forever encountered symbolically by others, and forever encountering others symbolically. Beyond the psyche is still part of the psyche. Again, this is related to those models that Andrew was developing. But I also sense that Elijah is slightly vexed by Jung's insistence on this question of being real or symbol. He's actually saying, I sense, don't deny my sovereignty. Don't question my ontological status. And this, my friends, I think is so significant. Because this is what the elves are saying. The elves are constantly saying, in all the accounts, whether it's Rick Strassman, who's here, hello Rick, uh, whether it's David's accounts or Terence McKenna's accounts or any of the other many accounts that I've encountered, the elves are saying, don't be so alarmed. Don't get so strung out by the weirdness of the situation. Listen to what we have to say. And again, this is reflected in Jung. He was puzzled by a dream of his dead father. And he was saying, did I dream of my dead father or did my dead father visit me in my dream? Until he realized this is irrelevant. What does my father have to say? So what are the elves saying? Well, again, I'm gonna use Jung here. I'm gonna use the model that he developed in 1958 for his uh, amazing essay on UFOs that some of you may be familiar with, where he does not concern himself with the ontological status, the material status of the UFOs, the flying saucers, even recognizing the possibility that they may call, cause radar blips, which is very curious. He looks instead at what they mean, and as you probably some of you are familiar, he identifies the UFO as arising out of that particular cultural, historical, political matrix of the Cold War after the Second World War, um, nuclear potential catastrophe, uh, potential for nuclear catastrophe, and all of this. And he looks at the UFOs as being circular, as being mandala imagery, the yearning for numinosity, and etc., etc., etc. It's a fantastic essay. Right? So I'm going to use his model and say not where are these elves and what are they, but what are they saying? Well, first of all, the elves are not angels. They're tricksters, mercurial, hermetic. They inhabit crossroads and crooked trees and standing stones on the moonlit moorland. They're encountered in certain environments, in reverie, in vision, in dream, in the flickering shadows of the fire, in nighttime woodland, in the moment of enchantment reading a child a fairy story. Here in this conference, this is an enchanting moment, I find. The elves lure us off the path, into the woodland, onto the moor. Disrespect them, and they'll lead you into the mire. They'll lead you off the cliff. And there are numerous accounts in uh, William Butler Yeats's and Lady Gregory's accounts of the um, fairy stories in Ireland, and also in Lady Wilde, um, numerous accounts of the pompous squire who is brought down a peg or two, trips on his horse, his horse stumbles and he falls into the village duck pond. Yeah, that's a kind of, a, the elves are laughing behind the trees, you know? This is, this is the sort of the disrespectful. But treat them respectfully, they'll still bring you down a peg or two, but they'll give you a gift. They'll grant you a gift, the gift of enchantment. 
the gift of dance and music and laughter. They'll give you psychic strength to undergo change. You see, the elves will lure you off the path, which is the same as saying they will pull you out of a rut. You see, they are agents of change, and change is not easy. The elves are allies for those resisting structures and forces and systems of control, aggression, injustice, and brutality. Not least because the elves can be aggressive, unjust, and brutal. According to Bordicus, for example, in the Book of Imaginary Beings, the elves steal cattle and can steal babies. Keep your wits about you. The elves are allies for those who are attempting to re-harmonize humans and nature. And in that respect, I see them as agents of ecology, agents of the environment. You see, it is not in the elven nature to bulldoze and dynamite. It's not in the elven nature to cut down trees and to poison streams and to slaughter the buffalo and to slaughter the whales. It's not in the elven nature to brutalise other cultures and to annihilate. You see, you look at the elves and they're described as mischievous and deceitful. Well, isn't that just another way of saying cunning and resourceful? And if we are hoping to modify those systems that brutalise and annihilate and disenchant, we must be cunning and resourceful. So don't ask an elf about his ontological status. <laughs> don't ask an elf whether he really is an elf, or whether he's a goblin or a pixie or a hobgoblin or a knocker or a brownie. They are self-transforming. It is not in the elven spirit to be categorised elf today, pixie tomorrow. Hallucination today, footprints in the butter tomorrow. Who cares? It's not in the elven spirit to take things too seriously. Aside, of course, from the elves of Middle-earth, you know, Legolas, for example, these guys are fairly solemn and somber and quite haughty, but they're capable of big magic. And of course they're solemn and somber. They are resisting Mordor. I would be quite solemn before an orc. I'm not certain I would be jumping around dancing. I'd flee. So sometimes it's necessary to have big magic. Sometimes it's necessary to fight steel with steel. And in that respect, I understand why the elves of Middle-earth are solemn and somber. And there are many elves that inhabit our world. I live in Canterbury. There is the seat of the Anglican church, and yet right up at the heart of ecclesiastical power, there's the grey elf himself, the green man, subtly laughing, perhaps grimacing. He's a reminder that these straight lines and these ordered systems and this pomp and ceremony, the polit political and ecclesiastical power, political is ecclesiastical power, will all one day be ivy clad, will one day be home for birds and bees and beetles, the green man abides, and we can abide in the green man. Well, there's Allen Ginsberg, a great elven character, dancing hairy and naked and horny, resisting what he calls Moloch with his elven spirit. There are Terence McKenna's elves, who come bounding playfully into existence, singing Sid Barrett. Another way for gnomes to say, Hooray. And these elves are saying, don't get so alarmed, do what we're doing. And what are they doing there? Playing mischievously with language, sort of throwing these funny language balls around. Well, there's Terence McKenna himself. He's a big green elf, yeah, with his funny voice. Yeah, and he's saying, don't trust anyone. Don't trust the elves. Trust your own experiences, your own intuition. But I also get the impression he's saying, but most of all, don't trust Terence McKenna. There's a lot of spin to his yarn. You see, the elves are tricksters. And the elves are healers. Tricksters are healers. And healing can be hard. The allies, sorry, the elves are allies for those who wish to heal. 
The elves are allies for those who dance in the shadows of the moonlight. The elves are allies and are agents of change and disorder and resistance and rewilding. But most of all, the elves are agents of re-enchantment. Muchas gracias.